Each year, Microsoft Research hosts hundreds of influential speakers from around the world, including leading scientists, renowned experts in technology, book authors, and leading academics, and makes videos of these lectures freely available. Okay, good morning, everyone. So, actually, in not all of algorithms, finding dense subgraphs is a, in the graph is one of my own favorite topics, so I was delighted to see the title of a detailed talk. Please. Uh, thank you. Uh, thanks a lot, Yuval. Uh, so, I'll be talking about de finding dense subgraphs and some other problems that uh, are related to it. And uh, okay, so, so the general theme of what I'm going to be talk talking about is that uh, you're given a huge graph and it could arise out of a variety of situations and we want to find induced subgraphs which are dense. Okay? And uh, in a vague sense, it, it has applications to a lot of things. For instance, uh, detecting communities in uh, social networks is a natural application. Okay? And uh, also, it, it's been used for detecting what's called link spam in web graphs. Okay? So, and of course, it has a clustering feel to it. So it, it's uh, used in a lot of clustering type problems. So let me describe some of these a little bit before we move to the actual problem. So, okay, so first is the example I'd consider social networks. So, so we have these graphs that arise from like friends of people and things like this. And uh, so usually, uh, finding dense subgraphs here means you're finding communities. Okay? Let's say people who belong to an institution and things like this. And uh, they usually have much more edges inside the community than they do to the outside. Okay? So, so this is uh, one kind of an example where you'd want to find dense subgraphs. And finding such uh, uh, things are useful because uh, you know, maybe they all have some common feature that you'd like to exploit. And the second example I spoke of is uh, what's called detecting link spam. So this has been used by some researchers in, for somehow trying to avoid the problem where people keep linking to each other's pages just so that their page rank improves. Okay. So one way of detecting this is to find small sets of vertices that have too many edges among them. So then they're probably just trying to fool the system. Okay. And, uh, one, uh, one thing about this example is that uh, it's different from the earlier one in that uh, you really have a small, uh, you really want the sets to be really small. Okay? So maybe there are big organizations where there are legitimately pages linking to each other and you don't want to find those. Okay, okay so how do we formalize such a question? Right? So here's the first cut. So this is a problem that has been called the max, maximum density subgraph. And the problem here is, uh, so you're given the graph and you want to find a subgraph H so that uh, you maximize the ratio of the number of edges to the number of vertices. Okay? So this ratio will be called the density throughout this talk and we want to maximize this. And uh, it turns out that this can be solved efficiently. Okay? So in any graph you can find uh, the, the, a subgraph that maximizes this quantity. And uh, it's known since the 80s, and uh, I can give you the reference. And uh, so it's based on a flow-based, it's a flow-based algorithm. And there are also very fast algorithms that have, say, approximation ratio 2 for this. Okay. But uh, so note that there's no restriction on size, which turns out, uh, I mean, people actually care about. There are some applications in which we don't really want, uh, we don't want to output graphs that are too big. So one, one way of capturing this is to have explicit restriction on the size. Okay, so the problem I'm going to consider in more detail is uh, one where you want to find a subgraph H on at most k vertices, and you want the number of edges to be as large as possible. Okay. So it's a very natural problem. And uh, it's what's called the densest k subgraph problem. Okay. And uh, as you can see, it, uh, the key here is that it's some natural optimization problem, and you have these small support constraints. Okay? You want only k vertices, sort of. And these are, uh, it turns out this is a general challenge to handle uh, constraints of this nature. Okay, so, so far we've seen practical motivations. So what about motivations inside theory? Okay. So here's a problem that has recently been 
uh, studied in connections with the unique games conjecture. So it's what's called a small set expansion problem. Okay? It's uh, really simple to state. It, uh, so, so you're given a graph which is of average degree d, let's say. In fact, let's assume it's regular and it has degree d. And uh, you want to distinguish between the two cases. The first is when there is a small set, let's say of size delta n, delta is given to you, uh, in which almost all the edges are actually inside. Okay? So 99% of the edges in, from inside this actually stay inside. In the second case, you're promised that uh, for any, any h of size at most delta n, almost all the edges go out. And uh, so this is a promise problem, and you want to distinguish between these two cases. Okay. And uh, it turns out that we don't know how to do this. So the small set expansion conjecture, so it says that uh, it's hard to distinguish between these two. And it turns out to imply the, the unique games conjecture, which is something everyone is interested in. Okay. But uh, as, you, as I stated it, it's easy to see that it's actually a, a subcase of the densest subgraph problem, because if you can solve densest subgraph, you can solve this efficiently. So, so it is, uh, it's, strictly, uh, it's strictly easier than densest subgraph, but we think that I'll try to convince you during the talk that uh, densest subgraph is a much harder problem than this. Okay. Okay. So what do we know about densest subgraph? And uh, let me point out uh, first the negative results. Okay, so we know it's NP hard because it generalizes clique trivially. And uh, so it's been shown that there is no polynomial time approximation scheme. Okay, so, so you can't get a one plus epsilon approximation for every epsilon. Okay, so this has been shown. And uh, further, it was proved that if you assume something more, so if you assume something more than NP hardness, it's what's called the random three sat assumption. So then you cannot approximate it to a factor better than 1.5. Okay. And the first was uh, first is due to Subhash code, and the other is due to Uri Feige. And OK, so what do we know with respect to algorithms? right? So the best known algorithm before what I'm going to say is for something just close to an n to the 1 third factor approximation. Okay. This is due to Feige, Kotsas, and Peleg uh, around 15 years ago. Okay. Now, well, notice the big gap between the two results, right? On one hand, we can rule out a factor 1.5 approximation, even assuming some fairly fancy hypothesis. On the other hand, we only know something like an n to the one third approximation, and and this is true for a reasonably natural problem, right? Okay. So, what do we? Okay. So that's what we know. Okay. So so, the, so then, what do we conjecture is true about this problem? Okay, so we conjecture that it's actually hard to approximate to some small fa uh, to some factor n to the c. Okay, so we think that the algorithms are actually tight, and our machinery to prove hardness is probably not as uh, well developed. Okay, and in fact, so one of the messages in the stock will be to say that uh, beating even a factor of n to the one fourth is a difficult challenge. Okay, so there is a natural barrier at n to the one fourth is what I want to say. Okay, and uh, the other point is that this is a problem which even seems to be hard on average. Okay, so I'll de describe a distribution over inputs over which we don't know how to solve this problem. Okay, and uh, so all the, all the known algorithmic tools fail, and it turns out that uh, people have even used this as a complexity assumption. Okay, so they've assumed so if you assume that densest subgraph is hard, then you can show some other things. Okay. So, so in general, if a problem is hard on average, something that algorithms people feel sad about. But uh, you know, there, there are some people who feel happy about this, and uh, turns out that cryptographers are one such bunch. Okay. So and uh, so, so these uh, so, so there's a public key crypto system, which is based on the average case hardness of densest subgraph. Okay. And uh, so, how does this? Uh, what's the rough idea? So. The crypto system uses a bipartite graph in which uh, you have some edges going across, and uh, somehow the dense subgraph hides the private key. Okay, so, so you can think of the graph as being public key. Everyone knows the graph, but unless you know the dense part, you can't quite decode it. So this is uh, I'm lying a lot here, but that's the rough idea. Okay. 
The other, other paper which uses this is, uh, it's about pricing financial derivatives. Okay, so this is a recent work by Sanjeev Arora and a few others at Princeton. So the problem is the following. Okay, so you have a bunch of assets. And uh, the question in these derivatives is that you want to bundle these assets together, and you want to form derivatives out of these. And uh, the problem could be that if you know, if someone who's bundling knows which assets are bad, then he can gain by bundling the bad assets together. Okay. <coughs> and uh, but you know the person who's bundling them will just say, "Look, I bundle them randomly." Okay? And if you think if densest subgraph is hard, then it's hard to tell between the two. So he'll sh he'll tell you that this is how I bundle the assets, and they look random to me, and you can't contradict him. Okay? So this is uh, one thing that uh, there's one other application of the hardness. OK, so here's a rough outline of the talk. Uh, I'm going to give an n to the 1 fourth approximation for the problem. Okay. And uh, the key thing about this is not the improvement in the factor, but the fact that uh, we somehow have an average case version uh, which we can solve. And uh, using the ideas from there, we can move to the worst case. Okay, so that's something that I think is interesting about this. And, uh, Okay, as I said, we don't know how to prove hardness for this problem. So, you know, one thing we could ask is, okay, so we know all these techniques, like linear and semi-definite programming hierarchies. So, do they at least uh, say something, right? And can we say that th these things don't work? So that's the, I'll roughly speak about that. And uh, I'll also talk about other continuous relaxations that you can write. We'll get to what these mean in a second. Uh, but Okay, so the last two talks will be a little, uh, last two parts will be a little speculative, a lot of hand waving involved. Okay. And at uh, this point, I should mention my co authors in a lot of these works. There are uh, Moses Charikar, Eddie Klamtach, Uri Feige, Arvindan, who's also a fellow student at Princeton, and Venkat Guruswami, okay. and Yuan Zhu. Okay, uh, but what I want you to, to remember is that. Uh, about this problem is the significance of the average case. Okay. So somehow it seems to be the key to understanding the problem. Okay. <coughs> so without further ado, let's go into the problem. So first consider this simple problem on random graphs. Okay. So, so I want you to distinguish between two classes of graphs. One in which uh, I just give you a random graph with g and p degree n to the one third. And, uh, in the, and in the other case, so I take G and P with the same probability, and I take a bunch of vertices. Let's say I take square root n vertices. And inside them, I add something like n to the 1 4th edges. Okay? Uh, sorry, n to the 1 4th times its size edges. Okay? So I make the degree artificially n to the 1 4th. Right? To see that you've actually done something non-trivial, note that any k size subset here has degree very small. You can take union bond calculation. It's a simple union bond calculation. Okay. Now, so here, you know, it looks like a big gap, right? So here, any case I subgraph has very small density, and here the degree is n to the one fourth. Now, the question is, how do you? Degree, you mean the average degree? Yes, yes, yes. Sorry. Let's say I even make every degree n to the. I was on the left when you say. Okay. Yeah. Uh, Oh, yes, yes, yes. I mean the average degree in the number of uh, vertices. Yes. OK. So how do we tell between these two? And uh, so one way is, uh, OK. So okay, let's think about this slightly simpler question, OK? So I, I have two random graphs, both are n vertices. One side, one you have uh, degree n to the 1 third. Here you have n to the 1 half. How do you tell? Well, you can see the degree and obvious things, but I want something more. But the question I ask is, uh, suppose you pick two vertices u and v, okay, and I ask how many length three paths are there between these two. So in the first case, you can do a simple calculation to show that for any fixed u and v, the number of, uh, the number of length three paths will only be log n with high probability. It will be O of log n. While in the second case, you can see that there will, uh, I mean, that in general, the number will be something like square root n. In particular, there will at least exist a pair where 
where the number of uh, length 3 paths is root n. Okay? So this is a simple calculation. And now how does this fit in? Right? So, so now we have a big graph. Uh, now we have a graph in which there's a degree n to 1 third, inside which there's something planted. Right? But now the key is to observe that this graph h, which was a random graph with degree this. Right? So this is like a mini copy. So it's a graph on k vertices, and its degree was k to the half. So this is kind of like the second example here, except that it's a k instead of n, right? And luckily for us, there were uh, the number of length three paths there was k to the half, which is still much larger than poly log n. Okay. So so it's important that in this test we got log n as the answer here and uh, n to the some polynomial in n as the answer here. And uh, so, so a simple test to distinguish between the two is uh, check if there exists some u and v with log squared and length three paths. Okay? Because in this case, there will be no, nothing. And here, only things inside h will, uh, there will always be some sets. So length three, you mean three edges? Yes, three Four edges. Vertices. Four vertices, yeah. yeah, including u and v. Yes. Okay. All right. So this is a simple test. Uh, okay, and uh, yeah, you can also check that we don't really need h to be random. Okay, so because the test we are doing is if there exists two vertices with many length three paths, turns out by uh, by accounting argument that as long as you have k to the half edges inside this k subgraph, you don't really. I mean, there will always exist some pair that has k to the half. Okay. What do you need? So, oh, in this case, I want the average degree to be that. So, we really need the average degree, but you can think of the minimum degree, it's fine. Okay. All right. So, this is a simple planted version. So, as you could see, this exponent of k is what mattered here. So, that's what we'll make formal in, a, in our definition. So, we define the log density of a graph uh, to be. Uh, to be the log of the average degree divided by the log of the number of vertices. Okay? So that means if you have a graph on n vertices, you say its log density is rho if the average degree is n to the rho. Okay? And, uh, okay. so, and the general result that we'll try to prove is that uh, if you have a random graph GNP with log density some rational number r over s, and, uh, and in the other case, you have random graph with something planted inside, but uh, it has log density slightly more. Okay? So it's always plus epsilon. Then you can distinguish between these two. Okay? So that will be the claim. So note that in the previous example, it was one third and half. Okay? And uh, right. So in this case, what we could show was that uh, you look for pairs u and v with many length three paths. And if the log density is more than strictly more than one third, then you can distinguish it. So one third was kind of a threshold here. Okay? So, so anything more than one third, you can distinguish. There'll be many length three paths. Okay? Now, the natural question is, can we have, is, does this threshold thing work for any row? Okay? So, so that'll be our claim. Okay? So another example I'll give is, uh, if you want log density three fifth, okay? so this means the degree is n to the three fifth. And uh, it turns out the right things to count. So earlier we were looking at pair two, two vertices and looking at length three paths. Now the right thing to do is to look at four tuples of vertices and look at structures of this kind. Okay? So you fix u, v, w, and x. And you look at how many such structures are there in the graph. So this is one, and maybe this is another, and so on. Okay? So you count these structures. And if log density is strictly more than 3 fifth, then there will be many such structures. Okay? And in, Okay, and in general, uh, if you want, uh, if, so what we do is we count appropriate tree-like structures. Note that for three-fifth we had a, we had this tree, and uh, and we count the number that are supported on a fixed set of leaves. Okay, by supported I just mean these are the leaves, and there exists some tree in the graph which is of this kind. Okay, and uh, we pick these such that the expected number of structures for any set of leaves is roughly constant. So these structures are chosen carefully like this. Uh, but we also, it turns out, we need some kind of a concentration result because uh, we want to show that for any set of leaves, uh, this bound is true. Okay? That uh, the number of structures is not much more than poly log n. Okay? So, this, the, so this means you can't choose any tree, you have to be slightly more careful. 
Okay, so and in general, what kind of trees work? Okay, so it turns out that we can take inspiration from Alice in Wonderland. And cat, what are known as caterpillar graphs will turn out to work. Okay, and uh, so caterpillars are graphs that roughly look like this. I won't describe how general how they look in for general R over S, but roughly speaking, it has R plus one leaves and it has so many vertices. Okay, so I won't say more than this. And the properties that we will have are that if you take look at GNP with log density strictly, strictly smaller than R over S, then you pick any R plus one tuple, and there'll be only poly log n such caterpillars. Okay. And, uh, and if you pick any graph with uh, log density some epsilon more than R over S, then there will exist a leaf tuple with more than k to the epsilon caterpillars. Okay. So this will be the distinguishing test. And uh, so this leads us to the claim that I said, that the distinguishing claim. Okay. So now let me give an example of how we prove a statement of the first kind. Okay. So I'll take an example of a caterpillar and show how we show pro properties like this. So it is a simple probability calculation. So I'll just do it for one value of the parameter. So let's think of R over S being 2 fifth. Okay. In this case, it turns out the caterpillar is like this. So we fix u, v, w. We want to find how many such structures there are with these uh, with u, v, w as the leaves. Okay. And the idea will be to bound the number of candidates for each of these internal nodes. By internal nodes, I mean these a, b's, and c's. And each of those will be at most log n. And uh, that means that the total number of structures you can have is only log q. OK. So let's look at some guy c. Okay. Now. Okay, so, so how do we bound the number of things, right? So, so we want the, the guys for A to be neighbors of U, right? So, so they're only like n to the two fifth, the degree was n to the two fifth, okay? And once you fix U, you look at how many things for B are there, they're n to the four fifth, it's two level neighbors. Okay. But of these, the candidate Bs are all neighbors of this fixed vertex V. Okay. So the number of such guys is only P times this because you need an edge to B. And uh, so, so the number of uh, candidates for B at this point is uh, n to the one fifth. Okay. And uh, then you get that the number of C's that you can have only with this information is n to the three fifth because they're all neighbors of this n to the one fifth size set. Okay. And uh, but of those, you only you only want things that are adjacent to W. Okay. And by the way, we chose the caterpillar. It turns out that p times n to 3 fifth is only 1. Okay. And you can make each of these statements with high probability statements. Okay. So you can say that the number of neighbors, these numbers will be concentrated around such value. Okay. And at the end, you can get this kind of a statement that the number of candidates for b, the pro, uh, for c, probability that it's more than 10 log n is something like 1 over n to 10. Okay. It means for every choice of u, v, w, this holds, and this finishes the proof. Okay. Okay. So, so we can do this for any caterpillars R over S, and this is the theorem that we get. Okay. So that uh, if you have uh, the pla uh, something planted slightly more, you get you can distinguish in time one over epsilon. Okay. Okay. So now, what about arbitrary graphs? Right. So that was all in the random case. Now, what can we do in arbitrary graphs? So. Okay, so, so we want a row factor approximation to densest subgraph, right? That was our stated goal. And by that we mean, so, okay, let, let me fix some parameters here. Let n, and, let n be the number of vertices in the full graph, and uh, I'll denote by capital D its degree. Okay? And for now, I'll think of it as regular and being degree D. You can easily reduce it to this case. And H will be a graph on, uh, so, so H is the optimum for this problem. And uh, it has uh, it's on k vertices and it has degree small d. Okay, so uh, just remember n and capital D for the full graph and opt has k and small d. Okay, and h is what I'll call the opt. And uh, the aim will be to find an h prime with average degree little d over rho. Okay, and by so this is the definition of a rho factor approximate. Okay, so, so these are things we it can assume. With, uh, very easily, so and we can assume these without loss of generality. Okay, so we can think of G as being bipartite. 
So we are interested in the density of graphs up to constants. You know, you can assume the graph is bipartite. And we are interested in an n to the one fourth approximation. So constants don't really matter. Okay. And we can think of, D, of the graph, the full graphs being deregular. And another thing is we can assume that this optimum graph H has minimum degree little d instead of average degree. So we can do the usual thing of removing uh, vertices that are smaller than d by 2 and so on. Okay. And also we are allowed to return a subgraph with uh, average d, uh, which is of size smaller than k. Okay. That's because we can just remove it and recurse. Okay. And uh, so this assumption is nice because we'll, always, we'll keep looking at sets of vertices and their neighbors. And it's nice if they don't intersect. Okay. okay. So another crucial assumption, which I will not justify, is that uh, we only the, the only interesting case is when k times capital D is n. Okay. So k was remember a parameter given in the problem. So it was uh, so so k is the size of the subgraph that you want, and uh, so this is the only interesting case from the point of view of the approximation. Okay, so other cases can only have a better factor. Okay, so this I will not justify. But uh, one implication of this is that uh, if you pick a random H, then it has density around constant. Okay. And uh, our aim will be to beat this constant by some factor. Okay. And uh, okay, so, so this is an assumption we can make. And okay, so now let me state, my, state the theorem. So suppose uh, we have n and d, and let's think of capital D as n to the row for some row. Okay. Now the theorem says that if little d is some c times k to the row, then I can find a subgraph, which is a small number of vertices, with average degree at least c. Okay. So, so c is the factor by which little d is more than k to the row. Okay. If little d is smaller than this, there's no guarantees. Okay. I'll just return one. Or so. I'll just return. Uh, some arbitrary matching or something like this. Okay. And note that the approximation ratio here is k to the row, because uh, there was c times k to the row, you're returning c. And by the way we chose parameters, so d was k times d was n. So the approximation ratio will be something like this, and it'll always be better than 1 fourth. Okay. And uh, well, at this point, there's no real surprise that the proof will involve caterpillars, because as I said, it's very inspired by the random, by the random case. And it'll involve caterpillars that correspond to rho. Okay. Now, rho need not, be a real, uh, need not be a rational number, which is why we get uh, n to the 1 fourth plus epsilon here. But it's a technicality. For now, let's pretend rho is a rational number. Okay. It's, uh, OK. So a simple observation is that, uh, so we want to return a subgraph which is uh, only on k vertices. Okay. But it turns out it's fine even if we return a bipartite subgraph, which is of the right density. So it has number of edges to be c times a plus b. So that's the number of edges divided by the number of vertices. And one of the sides has smaller than k. So once you do, once you have this, it turns out you can easily get to both sides being at most k. Okay, so this is what we'll do. Okay, so now I'll prove our approximation guarantee. I'll prove the theorem that I stated in the case of one example, which is r over s being one third. Okay, so yeah, this will be a little technical, but uh, you know, as uh, Noga says often. Uh, a talk is uh, supposed to have uh, one joke and one proof, and it's good if they're not the same. Right? So <laughs> I think uh, so, so. This will be the proof, and uh, hopefully there'll be other jokes. Okay. So all right. So R over S is one third. Right? So the setting we have is that the degree is n to the one third, and little d is c times k to the one third, and k is n to the two third because we thought of k times d as being n. Okay. So this is the setting. And now, the idea is the following. So in general, we'll be looking, uh, let's start with some vertex u and look at its set of neighbors. Okay. So we have the following. So we know that the set of neighbors has size at most d, because the graph had degree d. Okay. Now, what we know is that 
you, uh, that, that uh, if u was inside h, okay, then the minimum degree in h was at least small d. So we know that the intersection of the neighborhood of u with h is at least small d. Okay? So let's pretend we guess some u which is inside h. Okay? So, so for, for purpose of this proof. So, so then we have these two bounds. Now I'll claim that if we look at the neighbor of neighbors of u, then we have a fairly strong guarantee on the size of s. Okay? So what do we know about neighbor of neighbors? We know that it's size at most d squared, because there are d neighbors and it can expand to d squared. And I claim that if you look at its intersection with h, which is the optimum, then it has a size at least little d squared over small c. Okay? That is, uh, so there was this graph r, uh, there was this set r, and I want to say that uh, R almost expands fully in H. Okay. So inside H, the degree was at least small d. And the best it could have expanded by was something like R times d. And I want to say that it's close to that. Okay. All right. So why is that true? So this is just the copy of the claim. OK, so suppose that is not true. Okay. So, so now let's look at this subgraph, which is formed by R and S. So now that subgraph should have had a ratio of number of edges to its vertices to be at least c, right? Because uh, we we assume that s was small, we assume that s was smaller than r times d over c, and the total and the number of edges between the two is at least d times r because the minimum degree inside h was little d. Okay, so 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 we have a bound of the, so so we have a subgraph of density at least c inside. But how do we find it? Uh, now we can solve this max density subgraph problem that I earlier defined. I said that that can be solved in poly time. The problem there was that it was giving, so it could give graphs that have much more than k vertices. right? But that's OK here, because k is n to the 2 thirds. And the best you can come up with from here is, uh, is something where you have uh, n to the 1 third guys on one side. And, and that's fine, right? So, so okay. So, so if there existed such a, so if this bound did not hold, then we are done. Okay. So this will be the style of the argument. We'll uh, we'll have some inequalities of this kind. We'll say that if those bounds do not hold, then some local solving like this will actually give us a dense subgraph. Okay. So we can continue this line of reasoning. We can say that now work with this. Look at its set of neighbors. And we can say that if you looked at t, which is the neighbors of s and intersection with h, okay, h was the optimum subgraph, then it has to have a size at least something like this. Okay? If you work out the parameters, we can show that the size of t should be at least little d cubed by c squared. Okay? And t is the set, uh, is the intersection of this third neighbors with h. Now, OK, if you stack carefully, this can't be, right? Because the way we picked parameters, the size of h was k, while this d cubed by c squared is strictly more than, yeah, it's more than c times k. And uh, t was the intersection of some set with k. It can't have a size more than k. Right? So this means that at some step, you must have found a c-dense subgraph. Okay? And this finishes the proof. So the, so one of these things should hold, otherwise you will have found a dense subgraph, or you get a contradiction. Okay. And uh, all right, this finishes the proof. So and you want to say that the, like, the, the smaller side is always the smaller the like, Yes, and uh, right, that's uh, crucial. So we should note that uh, the second side is, th that one of the sides is smaller than k. And this will hold because of our choice of parameters. So all the parameters should be chosen carefully so that one of the sides will always be kept smaller than k. And then we do this, okay. right? Okay, and the, and even for arbitrary caterpillars, this will be the general outline. Uh, outline. So we'll always have some set of vertices w, and we say that we'll do some simple procedure on it, and if it fails, then we'll come up with a good bound that holds. Okay, and if we continue the, uh, doing these bounds, then eventually we'll get a contradiction. So this means that some step you should have found a dense subgraph. All right, so this finishes the algorithm for dense subgraph, uh, or at least this is all I would say about it. 
And uh, okay, so now what about lift and project methods? Okay, so I'll define these in a minute. Okay, so so these are a class of techniques that have been studied uh, pretty uh, intensely of late. Which is uh, okay. So here's a standard formula we use for for solving problems, right? So we can write an integer program, which is uh, you want to maximize some objective subject to things being zero one. And uh, we usually relax it so that you have uh, conditions between 0 and 1, the variables between 0 and 1, so they can have fractional values. And uh, if the integrality gap is small, then it means that the objective value is uh, approximated reasonably. Okay? But it turns out many, for many problems, the gaps are huge. And one way of dealing with this is to add more constraints to the, to the linear program. And there are these ways of systematic ways of adding constraints, which is what, which are what I call lifting operations. I won't define them in particular in in general, but uh, the idea is somehow that you'll have variables that correspond to pairs of events and things like this, pairs i j and so on. And uh, so they'll turn out that this has a strictly smaller integrality gap, or at most uh, uh, as big an integrality gap as the origin as this linear program. And there are these systematic ways of writing more and more constraints. Okay, so think of this as a polytope that you define. So the and uh, you are repeatedly chopping off parts of it. Okay, and the hope is, and there are ways of defining these so that if you do n steps of this, then you actually end up with the integer program. Okay, so then all the corner points will be the actual integer points that you started off with. And there are many ways, many systematic ways known of doing this. So the two things uh, are commonly used are what are called the Shirali Adams hierarchy and the Lasser hierarchy. Okay? So we won't need the details of this, but uh, this is the general outline of the thing. Okay? Okay. And uh, the crucial thing is that the kth level of the kth uh, level in this hierarchy can be solved in time roughly n to the k. So that's why it makes sense to ask this question. So uh, after a small number of rounds of this, do we have a very small integrality gap? Okay, so be because then, uh, let's say after some k rounds, we have a very small integrality gap, then we can solve the problem roughly in time n to the k. Okay? And so we ask this question for densest subgraph, starting with a natural relaxation for it. And it turns out this, th you can't do this. Okay, so, so we show that even after some t rounds of Shirali Adams, where t is fairly big, so t is something like log n. So solving this would already need uh, quasi polynomial time. So the integrality gap remains uh, roughly n to the one fourth. Okay, so n to the one fourth is what our algorithm could achieve, and somehow we we don't seem to do better than that. And also the gap remains n to the epsilon even after close to linear number of rounds of, La of the Lasser hierarchy. Okay. So I'd want to say that Lasser hierarchy is something that is thought of as a really strong uh, uh, SDP hierarchy. And uh, most of our algorithmic tools somehow seem to be captured by a small number of rounds of it. And the fact that even so many rounds of it do not help is strong evidence that the problem is actually hard. Okay. So it in fact shows that we need really new techniques if the problem can actually be done better. So natural things like counting, spectral-based techniques don't work. Okay. And uh, it turns out that the gap instances are actually random for these guys, uh, which is nice, because, uh, which is interesting, because uh, it sort of reaffirms our belief that random instances are the difficult ones. Okay. And then an let, let me finish the densest subgraph part with this interesting question. Right. So it's. Uh, so let's say we want to distinguish between these two cases. One, you have uh, a square root n degree random graph. And the other case where you have a subgraph h inside with a degree something like n to the 1 fourth minus epsilon. Okay? And uh, note that here, you, uh, if you look at any root n size set, uh, its degree is only at most log n. Okay? Sorry, this should be log n. Okay? And the question is, can you distinguish in poly time? And this we don't know, okay. so, and uh, this is why the n to the one fourth roughly comes into the approximation. So if we can do this better, then we think we can solve even the general problem better than to one fourth. Okay, so now 
What about other continuous relaxations for a problem? Okay. Uh, one such thing that I'll talk about is uh, uh, is what I call mixed norms. Okay, but uh, let's get into that. So, okay, consider this problem. Given a graph, I want you to find a set of vertices S such that the number of edges in inside S divided by the size of S to the one plus delta is larger than one. Okay. So this is something we just saw. This is like saying find an S of log density more than delta. And, but you can rephrase it in another way. You can say, try to maximize this quantity. Okay. So x transpose ax for any 0, 1 vector measures uh, how many edges there are inside s. Right? So if s is the indicator vector for some, if x is the indicator vector for some set s, this measures how many edges there are inside. And this roughly measures size of s to the 1 plus delta. Okay. Wrote this down so that it's invariant under scaling, although it doesn't matter in this case. But uh, okay, so it turns out that uh, this kind of a problem has roughly the same feel as problems of this kind. These are much more well studied. So where so x transpose a x is roughly like a x two squared. Uh, so it's actually for the square of the matrix. But uh, anyway, so so let's not uh, get into the detail. But but these problems have roughly a similar feel. And turns out these things are well studied. So they are what are called hypercontractive norms. Okay? So, so you want to maximize over all of Rn now. So over 0, 1 to the n and all of Rn doesn't matter much. They're similar up to a log n factor. Okay? And uh, so if you can show that this norm is small, so, if, so A is the adjacency matrix of a graph, you can show this norm is small then you can certify that small sets in the graph actually expand. Okay. So it basically means that this quantity is small, which means that there, is, there are no dense portions in the graph. Okay. And motivated by this, and it's, uh, I'll mention some work which is kind of uh, different from what I've been talking about. It's about computing norms of this kind. Okay. So this is one other question that I've tried to study. So you're given some matrix, and you want very natural problem. You want to just maximize a, the p norm of ax divided by the q norm of x, okay. and you want to find out when you can do this. Okay. So note that it generalizes the largest singular value, and there's also this well-studied problem called the Grothendieck problem, which you can get for certain values of p and q. Okay. Now, okay. So the question is, when can you approximate these? It uh, turns out that this is very badly understood. And the one case where we did understand, I've just mentioned a bit, but uh, in its full generality, it's maximizing a convex objective of a convex set. Okay, so you want to maximize ax norm p subject to the q norm of x being small. Right? So, so this is something we can't do by normal convex optimization. Okay? But there are some cases where we can actually do this. And this is in a joint work with Arvindan uh, last year. So, so if you have such a problem and p is smaller than q, then you can solve this problem and the entries of a are all non-negative. Okay? So if you have like the adjacency matrix of, matrix or some, of a graph or something, you can actually solve this. And uh, it turns out that even though it's not a convex optimization problem, there are so some features of it that uh, you can actually solve, okay? that you can exploit. For instance, we can prove that the level sets of, of this function, so you look at this function and you look at its level set, so they actually turn out to be connected. So, so they're not convex, but they are simply connected. And they also they have this nice property, local optimism, global optimism, so you can actually solve it. And uh, it turns out the solution is by a fixed point iteration, which, and which we can show converges fast. And uh, so this is when ent entries of A are non-negative. We also know what happens if you allow arbitrary entries. So here it behaves, uh, so you can reduce from max card and show that it's hard to approximate to a, uh, this looks complicated, but if it had been one here, then it's polynomial. It's something like n. So it's uh, something that's kind of like polynomial. Okay? So this is the kind of guarantee that you often get by parallel repetition, if you know. Okay? So, okay, so, so we know it's very hard if you allow arbitrary entries, and if you have non-negative entries, we can actually solve. Okay, 
All right, so what are some directions for the future? So we'd ideally like to understand the complexity of this uh, sparsity constraint, okay, because uh, I mean this somehow seems to arise everywhere, right? So it's not just uh, small subgraphs in graphs, but uh, there are also applications like compressed sensing where you want to show that uh, some matrix has, for instance, the RIP property where uh, for sparse vectors, okay. So for sparse vectors, it actually is an act, it's like an isometry and things like this, okay. And uh, it's also related to hypercontractive norms, as I was saying, and it's nice to have a better understanding of these. For instance, it's not known if computing these is hard, okay. And uh, this is something that would be nice to know. Uh, the other feature of our algorithm was that, uh, it, that we did something on an average case and then we could do, we could carry over such techniques for the worst case, right? So is this kind of paradigm useful in any other context? So that would be nice. Okay, and uh, another thing is that you can try to relate these things to, to more exotic problems, like uh, there's this question of tensor maximization that a bunch of people have studied. It also appears elsewhere. So it'd be nice to relate to these. And uh, okay, so since it's uh, kind of an interview talk, let me try to let me generally mention other things I'm, I kind of think about. So one of the questions which I was kind of which I was talking about a little earlier is uh, the question of eigenvectors in GNP. Okay, when P is reasonably big. Okay, so a lot we know a lot of things about eigenvalues and uh, like there's this Wigner semicircle law and so on. But uh, you know, somehow, no. I mean, people don't know much about eigenvectors. Okay? So, for instance, our entries well spread out and things like this. And we tried to take some basic steps in this, so we can do it for some very simple cases. Then it's joint work with Sanjeev, so it's kind of like a foray into this. But uh, we have only preliminary results. I'll be happy to talk about these. Okay, and. Uh, Another thing that I've recently worked on is uh, using some tools in convex geometry to study a, a question that rises in differential privacy. Okay. So, you know, basically it's like, uh, I used to think of privacy as being something mysterious, you know, as differential privacy, but yeah, this is one, uh, so I know something about it now. And, uh, okay, what do I mean by unconditional here? There's something called the hyperplane conjecture in convex geometry. And uh, so there was an algorithm, there was a mechanism for pr privately answering certain queries. And it was shown to be good if, uh, if this conjecture holds. And we showed that you can find a different mechanism which actually avoids depending on this conjecture. Okay, so, so that is the work I did with Ravi Shankar, Krishnaswamy, and Kunal Talwar. Actually, you guys must have seen him yesterday, but uh, okay, yeah, thanks a lot. Yeah. Questions? Uh, yeah, any questions? So can you only, like, is it, is these, uh, so you count these caterpillars, is that true, or can you count other, if you want to count, count them, possibly some other structures? Yes, for the random case, you can actually do. Suppose you have a ran, I mean, random graph of some bigger log density inside another random graph. You can count a lot of things. There are all these, uh, what are they called? I mean, you can count like four cycles and things like that. And they all have some thresholds at which they start appearing. So you can do those. But uh, somehow caterpillars we found are very useful in the general case. So we don't know how to handle this. Also, there was this other problem, uh, there was this other good thing about using trees, which was that uh, we could show that uh, the planted thing need not actually be random. So it could be any subgraph that has log density at least strictly more than the original graph. So that is that happens only when it's a tree because we use this counting argument and then you get that there has to be some leaf tuple on which there are lots of things. So that's the reason we use caterpillars for that. That's the reason to use trees, but that's the reason to the most, not the most general trees. But right, but uh, yeah, actually, I guess the fair answer is there might be other trees, but these were the simplest we could find. So. But, but it yeah. might so be easy to improve the power and the Yeah, there Sorry? If, if, but could it perhaps improve the, I mean, if you're trying to distinguish two particular powers, then there might be a better 
tree. Yes, that would be a nice path, if. Uh, like complexity. Right, right, right. This right now we pick some rational number between uh, delta and this plus epsilon, and uh, we only have this one over n to the one over epsilon. You could bring it down to yeah something better. That would be nice. But uh, yeah, I don't know how to do that. I guess right. So what if, if, like if the threshold is p by q, right, or something, right? So you, or oh, whatever, r by s. Mm -hmm. You needed uh, r leaves and s total nodes, right? That's the cutler pillar you picked. Right. I guess if you pick any tree with these two things, it might work, right? Or no? Uh, if you pick. Oh, no, 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 it doesn't because, uh, I mean, so you need this concentration bound that I was saying. So if you can see the board, I can draw one figure that will not work. Okay. So suppose I pick trees that are kind of lopsided, right? So this will look obviously lopsided, but uh, as an example. So let's say I pick a tree, sorry. I pick a tree like this, okay? Uh, I claim that this is the wrong tree, while this is the right one. Okay. Uh, but the point is that if you picked any u, v, w, x, okay, and this is for log <laughs> density being 3 fifth, okay. so this is the example that I showed. So that means p is uh, n to the minus 2 fifth, because the degree was n to 3 fifth. Now, so what happens here is that there will be some four tuples u, v, w, x for which there are lots of such trees. Okay. So in expectation, it's still true that uh, the number of trees is, uh, uh, for, for some u, v, w, x is on, only <coughs> constant. But uh, whenever these three guys have a common neighbor, there will be lots of trees. Okay. And recall that the test we are using is if you know if there exists some uh, four tuple that has lots of trees. So we can't use things like this. So somehow we need these numbers all to be between. In this case, the problem is that this the expected number of candidates for this guy is smaller than one. And whenever it is one, uh, whenever there is some common neighbor, it turns out there are a lot more for the others. So. Right. So, so you need some balancing, but say. Yeah, there balance, are still lots of. Balance binary, 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 binary. Right, right, right. I think well. they will work well. Or whatever, depending on R and S, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I think as long as you ensure that if you do some calculation and find the expected number of guys for each node, if you find that that number is uh, between 1 and S, N, right? It's not strictly, it's not less than 1 or something, then uh, I think it will work. Will it get beyond what you Will it get some improvement from Yeah. <coughs> Not that I know of. Sorry. <coughs> yeah, that would be very nice. <laughs> Thank you.